Hello everyone. Isaiah, which in Hebrew means the Lord is salvation, lived in Jerusalem in the kingdom of Judah about 700 years before Christ. He was the first of four major Hebrew prophets along with Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel who prophesied the coming of Jesus Christ. The book of Isaiah is one of the most important and poetic books in the Bible. It is believed to be the work of more than one author, partly because of the different styles of writing, vocabulary, and the differences in the prophetic messages. The book therefore is generally divided into three parts. The first part, composed of chapters 1 to 39, is attributed to the proto or first and real Isaiah. On the second part, from chapters 40 to 55, to the detero or second Isaiah, whilst the third part, from chapters 56 to 66, to the trito or third Isaiah. Friends, a dominant theme in the second part of the book is that of servanthood. Four texts in particular, which are also collectively called the servant songs, describe the call and work of a certain servant of the Lord or God's servant. Friends, in the first song, the Lord himself introduces his servant as the one whom he has chosen, in whom he delights and his spirit abides, and to whom he has given the work of redemption. Specifically, this is to proclaim the good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and healing for the sick. In the second song, the servant presents himself as the one who has been called from the womb to restore the children of Israel to the Lord and to make them as a light to the Gentiles so that they too will recognize his saving power. In the third song, the servant identifies himself as the one who obeys and responds to the will of God. In the fourth song, the Lord portrays the servant as the one who suffers and dies, but later is raised high and greatly exalted. Friends, today's first reading is part of the third song. In the verses preceding today's text, the Lord tells us about the purpose and mission of his servant. Friends, the Lord reveals himself as the faithful husband who, through his servant, wants to forgive his unfaithful and forsaken but not divorced wife, Israel, and to restore her to the place of blessing. Friends, what we read today is part of the servant's response to the Lord's mission. First, the servant is crystal clear about his master's authority. He reveals that he is not acting on his own, but on his master's behalf. He points out that he has already been trained by the Lord himself to know and speak the word that will help to sustain the weary. Nonetheless, he is awakened each morning to hear what the Lord speaks. Thus. The servant makes known that his training, his every word and deed, come from a greater authority, the Lord himself, and that he continues to learn by listening to his master, just like any other true disciple or student does. Secondly, the servant attests his submission to suffering. He confesses that, unlike Israel, he has not rebelled nor turned away from God, even if his mission involves physical, mental, and emotional suffering, like persecution, mocking, whipping, beating, pulling of his beard, and so on. Thirdly, the servant expresses unwavering confidence and assurance in the help of the Lord. He believes that because the Lord is the source of his calling, and with the Lord's help, he will not be put to shame. Instead, the Lord will vindicate his honor. Thus, the Lord himself becomes the source of the servant's confidence and hope in the midst of suffering. Friends, in the Bible, 
The term servant of the Lord has been applied to individual people, certain groups of people, and the nation of Israel. However, this expression applies to Jesus of Nazareth more than anyone else. Friends, there are many instances recorded in the Gospels in which Jesus is depicted as the servant of the Lord that is spoken of in Isaiah. In several discourses, Jesus, as a servant of the Lord, read and expounded the prophecies of Isaiah. In addition to these things, the Gospels recount that 1. Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom of God and performed many miracles to show that he was from God. 2. Jesus frequently spoke of his inseparable and reciprocal relationship with God and called God his Father. 3. Many times Jesus claimed that all of his words and actions were coming from his Father. 4. Jesus was fully God and yet fully a man on this earth amidst humankind, who often slipped away to the wilderness and equipped himself with the power to speak the words that would help sustain the weary. 5. Jesus was mocked, beaten, spit upon and crucified. Thus, Jesus manifested himself definitely as the suffering servant that the prophet had announced, the long-awaited Messiah, who would be faithful and obedient unto death. 6. By faith, Jesus gave himself to God. By faith, he submitted to suffering and shame. Therefore, at his resurrection, he was vindicated by the Lord God. Friends, Paul writes that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Friends, what is the message for us? 1. God himself has chosen all of us, Christians, as his servants, and has specifically assigned a place that he wants us to be in, a task that he wants us to do, the time that he wants us to act on, and a people that he wants us to serve. 2. The Word is our training manual to be servants of God. Like Jesus, we should constantly seek our Father's guidance so that, through his Word, we can bring the light of Christ to those in darkness including comfort, hope, and life to people trapped in discouragement, despair, and suffering. 3. We should allow ourselves to be trained by God so that, like Jesus, we too can speak boldly with an instructed tongue, even in the face of ridicule, mockery, and opposition. 4. Just as Christ did, we should also show our loyalty to God by being obedient unto death. Friends, obedience to God proves our love for Him, demonstrates our faithfulness to Him, glorifies Him in the world, and opens avenues of blessing for us. 5. Like Jesus, we also must put all our hope and trust in God. We should be confident that our God will uphold us and not deceive us. He will always assist us in the midst of our trials and will not bring on us the humiliation of trusting in a false hope. Amen. God bless you.